works. I can hear you guys great. Great. We okay. can hear you as All right, well. wonderful, wonderful. Well, okay. All right, Raja, well, pleasure to, to meet you on Instagram, at least, and it's, it's great to connect. And um, why don't you go ahead? I mean, I think you can give the best intro for yourself. Go ahead and let people know who you are, what you do, and all the all the cool things that you do. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. I'm Raja. I co-founded a company called Seed Health, uh, my, my co-founder, Ara, and I'm mostly lead uh science research and development um technology product productization uh and just like basic good old-fashioned academic scientific research wonderful um, love it i uh let's see i mean i first i i've been fascinated with the microbiome since one of the very first papers in the field ever came out uh, it was a, a pretty fascinating story where they took the microbiome from an obese mouse and they transplanted it to a lean mouse and it totally changed its body composition. And so that's kind of like was a shot heard around the world in this field. Uh, you know, if, if things like a, like a, anything that relates to aging or weight loss, immediately everyone seems to care about. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was kind of a way to Trojan horse this other research and microbiology and these other areas. So uh, about 10 years, 15 years later, we um, <clears throat> started the company and the concept is very, is very unique in that, you know, we don't really think that the best research in any frontier field comes from the R&D team of one company or, or within one place. So uh, we really work with the best scientists in the world, um, regardless, uh, you know, there are different people in different places for for different things, um, but it's kind of like uh, this ability to partner with the top scientists in the world to bring their 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 work to life, and that's one of the big reasons that I'm excited about uh, waking up and doing what I do every day. Yeah, I love it, and mm -hmm. and we love it like that research and the R and D and just applying it, whether it's it's something like seed or private practice, or I mean, it's like this wave of application that goes from from researchers and developers, you know, entrepreneurs to health professionals. We love that, and it, and it's definitely affected our our practice as well, and that's why we love just that's why we found the gut actually because we we're like oh it's not really what we're eating it's what our microbes are eating and and learning more about these microbes and learning about these ecosystems inside of us and then they make new uh, metabolites from that and they are creating all these wonderful chemicals that synergistically work and it goes on and on and so we've been fascinated by it so we do have some questions for you and uh and it's it's great because this is something of course we're going to be focusing a little bit on seed for the most part because that is the you guys have developed a daily symbiotic and so can you give us some insight onto that because you've chosen specific strains for the symbiotic which a lot of people think of yeah i went to costco i picked up my probiotic and i'm taking it and but you guys have a daily symbiotic that's based so much on on really great exactly. research so we would love some insight on that as to why you chose these specific strains in that. Yeah, you know, one thing people are usually surprised to, to learn about is that um, different strains of bacteria, even if they're in the same species, can have 50%, 60%, sometimes genetic diversity between other strains. So you can't just read, look at something that says like bifidobacterium longum and just assume, okay, well, I, I pick up a probiotic, it has this species that this is really good. Some of the very like simple or elementary mechanisms by which probiotics can be beneficial, like acid production, um, you know, colonization resistance, like these things are more generic properties. But this wave of, of microbiome research is really teaching us that chains are very different and uh, they have to also mm -hmm. cooperate well together. Um, and so we went through a pretty extensive strain banking and strain cultivation and scale up process when we were founding the company um, under the leadership of our chief scientist who was is one of the most celebrated uh, uh, scientists in, pro in the history of probiotics, you know, more papers and pioneered the definition with the, um, the, the global definition of the term in multiple publications. And um, what we really wanted to understand was a, well, first of all, when putting, when, when, developing this formulation, I think we're still the only uh, some product that has multiple strains of the same species. So you'll have three different 
bifidobacterium long gum strains, for example, right? Instead of just one within this, within this product. So that's very important because um, microbes have a lot of functional redundancy. And so you want to make sure that you're including as broad of a representation of the genes that you really want. The second is that we, we looked for outcomes that were beyond the gut. So obviously gastrointestinal and digestive benefits is one of the areas that people most immediately feel um, that microbes, probiotics, or uh, you know, symbiotic is just a, a, a better, <laughs> a more advanced probiotic. Uh, you know, it's, th there's many ways um, that, that these, these organisms work and, and sometimes they're out of the gut. And so some of our research is on signaling to the gut skin axis or through regulating host cholesterol or through making micronutrients. And all of these are data that we've published or um, uh, have been you know, peer reviewed on our strains. And mm -hmm. so the concept here with this product is to say, well, if you take a probiotic or if you could experience benefits in any of these areas, this is the right combination of microbes as like a base, base layer and entry level. I think that's why we've experienced, people have had such a positive uh, experience with, the, with taking DSO-1. Yeah, yeah. And if I, if I could say, I mean, just to kind of apply that to us, so as, as dietitians in our practice, it's like, you know, someone saying, yeah, I eat food. And we go, okay, well, what, what kind of food? And then let's say it's white lettuce. And then it's like, okay, well, what kind of lettuce are you eating, right? Because there's the iceberg and there's romaine. And then even in romaine, there's various species. And then there's red leaf lettuce. And each one, it's like, yeah, it's lettuce. But there's so many different types of lettuce varieties. And even when I grow lettuce in my backyard, let's say, that has a genetic fingerprint that's unlike a lettuce being grown maybe the county over or, you know, that's in Whole Foods or whatever. So this genetic diversity, it applies to food and then it applies to these microbes as well. So we see these systems in play on different levels. So I love that. It's and so I, cool. I, I so appreciate also the research that Steve puts out on aspects even outside of just gastrointestinal benefits, right? You all have spoken on the gut skin connection, cardiovascular gut connection. Oftentimes people buy probiotics, they purchase probiotics, they take probiotics in order for them to experience GI benefits. And oftentimes they'll say, oh, I took it for two weeks, it didn't really work for me, so I stopped it. And maybe not even realizing that, oh, that was when my eczema and my dermatitis kind of Calm down that flare that I had been experiencing, my scalp psoriasis, my allergies that I was experiencing. So I think it's so great that you are, as a whole, as a company of seed, really shedding light onto the different microbiomes that we have throughout our body and how they communicate with one another and how really the nucleus of it all, in essence, is that gut microbiome. And if we're able to kind of feed it more properly and nourish it more properly through, yes, lifestyle, diet, and in with other appropriate inputs that that can really show its benefits elsewhere yeah and and on that i mean what and one of the questions we have here is is your ds1 you know the daily symbiotic you did do a clinical trial on irritable bowel syndrome right we we deal with a lot of ibs patients like we love for those i'm, I'm sure there are many and then when we repost this and everything who haven't maybe seen this research like could you give like a synopsis of it or like what what did you find? What were the outcomes of that? Uh, so IBS is a very interesting condition. Obviously, you have to be really careful in not overrepresenting, uh, you know, certain uh, therapeutic treatment treatments as as would relate to drugs. But you know, when we designed this study, we actually did have to go through FDA, um, even though we're not looking at um, you know drug drug treatment. We had to go through the same same process and the same protocols to just study this, this in a population of people that have a disorder, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, and so you hear all the time, like conflation of these different things or even different advices for IBS, but it's very hard to say, you, you can't really, you, you shouldn't trust, <laughs> you, you can't really trust when people make those types of claims because that there's a very clear regulatory process you have to go through. Um, what's very interesting about IBS though, is that it's, well, a couple things. So one is that believe it or not, there's actually like a, 35, 40% like placebo response rate within IBS. So that shows you how much of a neuropsychological component there really is to these conditions. And, and um, the, the thinking that you're going to feel better actually helps a lot of people. Um, and so when we designed our trial, we actually had to do a, what's called a placebo run-in 
So people come in and everyone gets the placebo and if people start saying they feel better, we have to exclude them from the trial because we want to get the people actually understand biology, right? So it's a very elegant, um, it's, a, it's a lot harder to, to do and takes a lot more time, but it's a, it helps you understand the biology a little bit better. Um, we're doing interim data analysis right now. And so until it's published that I don't uh, want to speak too, 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 too much on it, but um, the outcomes that we're really looking for are um, like, everything from structural, from like changes in stool composition and, um, and feelings of discomfort and pain and tolerance to different foods all the way to the stability uh, of the microbiome. And so we're doing deep read sequencing of the microbiome before and after and all these patients and they were comparing the analysis like uh, people, patients intervention between the placebo and then also the intervention people back against themselves. So against baseline, uh -huh. right? So what, what, yeah. what did it look like before? What does it look like at the end? And, those types of study designs are just wildly interesting because you show safety, you show tolerability, you show gut microbial changes, and then in a, a relatively higher amount of people, you're going to see some sort of a benefit. And um, again, when we when when that publication's out, we'll make sure to share it with you. But it's uh, it's a, the, the trial is being done at Beth Israel, which is a teaching hospital at Harvard, and so it's run by the clinic of Anthony Lembo, who who is one of the top uh, experts in IBS um, in the world. It's so amazing. I'm so impressed by your organization. Like you guys are more of, I mean, I think you guys say this on your website where you're more of a research organization that happens to make a symbiotic, right? Like DS01. DS and it's so cool. I mean, how did, I mean, just to kind of go into that, I mean, are, do you guys have multiple like simultaneous trials or what's, what's some exciting research you guys are doing in your opinion or, or, you know, combining or multiple things going on at once, I'm sure. So, what, what's something excited that you're excited yeah, about? Yeah, well, we, we, we got some very, very uh, strong data that um, is, was, was written up in a manuscript. It's out for review right now at, at a journal on um, after, after taking a, in, a, in a gut model system, uh, modeling the effects of antibiotics. Uh, and then mm -hmm. the, whether taking DSO one can induce a sort of metabolic uh, microbial recovery within the gut microbiome. And so, you know, as this, I, I can share this because the, the, the publication is now uh, written and out for review, but we saw a dramatic um, rebound of short, organic short-chain fatty acids in as little as 24 hours after taking DSO-1. And wow. so what's, what's, what's happening is that these organisms are metabolically active and they're producing metabolites that are cross-feeding with your own existing microbiome to help it have a better recovery after a course of antibiotics. So I, and after alcohol as well, ethanol was another uh, challenge in this trial to the, to the microbiome. So I think that type of research is ex extremely exciting. Um, one thing we've also now published a, a, a paper a couple of weeks ago now on um, the survivability of the strains within our capsule system. So that shows that the entire formulation works well together, that the organisms don't compete against one another, which is very important. Um, and also, we're the, we, we're the first to show 100% survivability of microbes and, um, at, in the middle of the small intestine. So that's where most of the immune system is. You want to have that precision small intestinal release profile, right? You don't want it to overshoot into the colon or open up too early in the stomach where you get a lot of loss, like multiple log loss of cells. So um, that's, really, that's really exciting because it's like, it, at least you know, right, that what you're buying isn't just going to wipe that be wiped out in the first stage and you have had a chance to be efficacious and that's just a very critical part uh you know that's that's actually not even biology it was more technology it was like figuring out the right densities and polymers of the capsules and there's two capsules one inside of another how what's what one's going to release in one place one's going to release in another like it's you know that yeah it's super exciting to me to, to think about like really validating that probiotics can get where you need them to go in a reproducible way. Like, I think that's very, I mean, underappreciated part. A lot of companies talk about it, but no one really shows data. Yeah. You said, you said two huge things there. And, and yeah, one that you, that we just left off on is the survivability. Like mm -hmm. it's basically so many probiotics out there, are like no biotics, right? It's like, they say they're probiotics, but really you might be getting no biotics. And I, I know I'm just being funny there, but like, the survivability like that that is a huge i mean advancement you guys have made of creating and i kind of 
I remember I was playing around with the capsule and I kind of took it apart and I'm seeing it, it looks so cool. Yeah. Like the capsule, like you open it, and there's like another little capsule and it's surrounded by some ingredients. And then like, it's just cool to even look at it and take apart and play with. And that, that tech aspect going into this kind of like complement to your healthy lifestyle in the symbiotic. I mean, we've been impressed by you guys, like, every little thing, even the packaging that the seed bottle came in, right? That it's compostable and it, it can decompose and it's made from algae. Just so many conscious things you guys have done that really made us go, wow. And that's why we're even, you know, doing the live and we, we want to partner with these amazing companies like yours. And it's like, this is so cool. We like geek out about it and really get excited. It, it excites us as well. And then the second thing you said was like, you're doing the study on so, so just to clarify, post-treatment of an antibiotic with your daily symbiotic, and you're seeing some some good things happen, and and you're saying so that publication's out for review now. So it's, going it's to out like for review. review. Yeah, we're, we saw things. we saw we saw a lot of butyrate production. We saw a lot of acetate. I mean, a recovery of a lot of interesting and um, relevant sh short chain fatty acids. That's so cool because that, I mean, that's something we're always saying. And really what, what I tell patients is like, you have a short chain fatty acid deficiency, right? It's like so many people out there have a short chain fatty acid deficiency. And then the question we always get is, what do I, I you know, I have to take probiotics. What do I take after? How, what's the best thing I could do for, I mean, I'm sorry, antibiotics. What's the best thing I could do for my gut? Like, what do I do? And so this is great follow-up research because we were, the study that we were at the, in 2019, we were at the Gut Microbiota for Health Conference in Miami, and they had released a study showing Israel. out of Israel that, you know, really the best thing to do after a round of antibiotics is nothing. And it's like, wow, okay, you know, but I guarantee the probiotic they were using was not you know, DS01, right? I, I guarantee it wasn't as robust. It wasn't as thoughtful. It wasn't as well put together, even in the capsule, let alone anything else. So it's it's really cool. I'm yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I, I had a lot of problems with that paper when it came out, even though it was really high impact. But fun, funnily enough, strangely enough, we're actually collaborating with those scientists now. So that, mm -hmm. that yeah, the, authors, the authors of that paper... Um, but what you but what you saw is even even in that probiotic selection uh, after about four months or six months all the groups they 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 recovered the same right so it's yeah. it, it's really less about and now even the field isn't looking at alpha diversity and these like more you know time to time to baseline recovery I think that's a bit um, you know outdated now but right. what we're really looking for is function what's the functional composition and what's different the, the features that different things are having functionally and that's what we spend a lot of it's you know um in most fields when they start with a big data element people sometimes they forget about the fact that it's you need, you need to have a mechanism of action and there has to be like a strong functional effect you just can look at the genetic data and think that's enough but everyone's mm -hmm. finally coming around around to that part Love it. love it. And I love that you're running all these amazing human clinical trials, right? Because so many trials for gut have been on mice. And as informative as they are, I think it's so important to have that human clinical data. So that way we can, like you said, kind of zero in and really be targeting more efficacious products. Those that are, like you said, time to release. We're starting now to consider genetic predisposition that people also have, genetic mutations that people might have and different strains that might benefit them for those various reasons. So I think that this is really exciting. I'm really excited to read these studies and learn more about this. Mice, um, and... my, mice are very different. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's some great studies that came out of mice mm -hmm. as for lead generation, but that's exactly the point. You know, one of, one of the uh, projects we're very excited about is actually involves thousands and thousands of people and, and sequencing the metabolites, microbial metabolites. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking not just on their stool, but now you're also looking in their blood, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we get fixated on just like the stool sample or the gut microbiome, mm -hmm. but it, it's it, the, the interplay between, you know, I'll give you one, one interesting statistic that I learned, which uh, from data that I saw that I don't know if it's been published yet or not, but after a course of antibiotics, you can't I, recognize yourself based on you can't repair your blood sample back with the person for about mm -hmm. a week or two and then there's slowly more rebound mm -hmm. and you start to get the sig signature but from a metabolomics perspective you can't cluster 
you, you're not you for that period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's you, what, what you were before a course of antibiotics, what's in your blood is no longer you anymore for a period of time. It's, it's just very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to that approach of like like the slash and burn approach of, of antibiotics, right? It is kind of like a mini nuclear bomb that just lays waste. And it it's almost it's like something you look at a place that hasn't been bombed and you look at it after you, it's unrecognizable, right? At least for a short time until you rebuild. And that's what those microbes are most likely doing. They're having to restructure and rebuild and repopulate and it takes time. That's just crazy. I mean, when people hear that, it's it's mind blowing, right? It's like you're you're genetically not even you, and that just shows. I mean, I, I know the last I read, it was like ninety nine percent of your DNA is actually microbial DNA. I believe that's still the case. I haven't really seen an update, but it's just crazy to think ninety nine percent of the genetic material in and on my body is microbial. Like that's crazy. Yeah. So but, when people hear I, that, I, I'll, I'll have to I have to clarify. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's true. But what those genes code for is way different than what your it, it, it's not ninety nine percent in importance and abundance. Maybe yes, but th yeah. that one percent of the human genes is still driving everything that you see in your phenotype and your biology. Like that's a very important one percent. Yeah, totally. Yeah, very important. And that's why yes, this clarification and and that kind of yeah, getting these multiple perspectives of yeah, it's not it's not to say total function is. Than in the 99 percent for sure so mm -hmm. but it's just so cool to, to think of that though it's really exciting. for sure yeah. we'd love to hear because again as dietitians we're all about lifestyle right so we mm -hmm. counsel our patients on diet physical activity um mental health what were any confounding variables or exclusion criteria that were part of some of the studies were there any lifestyle factors that played into those participants in your studies and you know what a question we always get is like how do i know if a probiotic is right for me so that might lead you into then telling us like who who is the ideal person who might benefit from seed uh in terms of i mean Exclusion criteria, we always, mm -hmm. it, it, the, the main goal in designing trials is that you don't want to get bad data and you want, you want it to be as clean as possible. So for an antibiotics trial, people that took antibiotics within 30 days or 60 days or 90, I, I forget the exact number, you know, obviously you want to exclude those types of people. Um, in IBS, it's IBS type C and IBS type M. You don't want IBS type D because you're trying to understand a normalization effect, right? Not a, mm -hmm. Uh, if, if, if you're having extreme diarrhea, it's usually a, a it's, it's, it's related to more pathogen or, um, in a, you know, as th things that are less microbially driven. And so you want to just really focus on IBSC, IBS type M cohort, for example, for that trial. Um, in terms of who would benefit the most from DSO one I mean, a lot of the benefit, it, it's just a question of like, what one wants to optimize for, right? So obviously the people that are the strongest responders are people that have some kind or that feel the strongest response or the ones that have some sort of digestive um, imbalance or uh, you know lack of regularity, poor stool composition, bad stool hydration, um, mm -hmm. uh, long, long time on the toilet, like an ineffective, like it's called evacuation time. Um, you know, like there's a, there's a whole parameter of like mostly gastrointestinal assays, which I think are probably the best benefit. Now, the next question is like, what I, I, I can't tell someone um, what intestinal permeability is going to do for them. The internet seems to tell it, people that intestinal permeability is involved with everything, right? Or like a breakdown of like your gut barrier. Um, that's less my concern on like what that actually, I think those take a very long time for people outside of our group that'll actually correlate intestinal or, or associate um, permeability with some sort of condition. But what's interesting to us is whether our, DR, our microbial cocktail can fix that, right? So we designed mm -hmm. an assay that's called a tight junction protein assay, which looks at the mm -hmm. intracellular junctions and which microbes and which strains in the formulation phase actually induce a very strong, so think of it like a stitching up effect of, of, the, of the gastrointestinal mm -hmm. uh, barrier, right? So we, we know that that happens, but I can't tell you that your psoriasis or your eczema is a result of that, so DSO-1 will fix it, right? Like I, I, we just don't, you just don't know. There's, these things are multifactorial. Um, and then mm -hmm. last, lastly, I would say like there's uh, kind of this, 
interest, very interesting concept that the host and microbes, they are engaged in a lot of crosstalk and it's involved in the regulation of the immune system. I think it's almost impossible to really drive, drive uh, design those trials, but we do know that there is um, definitely a communication and, and, and immu immunological signaling between our strains and, and the host immune system. And so I don't know to what extent, again, like that would be used just pro as like a form of like responsible nutrition or to be pro proactive about your health versus like in what conditions that could actually be beneficial. Um, but from a science and a research perspective, I think that's a very interesting observation. Totally. And yeah, I love what you said. I mean, it's so multifactorial. And this goes to a great question we get because, you know, especially us as dietitians, we're, we're probably biased, right? We're like, yeah, food. And, and we always, we talk about a foundation of food. So I guess this goes kind of the, the question we had was more like, where do you see, I, I can see seed being, or especially, yeah, the DS01 therapeutic. It's also just kind of maintenance it's also it kind of fits and crosses over so many categories but like is it is it more of an enhancement is it that therapeutic is it the maintenance and then if it's built on a really strong foundation of a of a diversity of healthy robust plant foods and fiber and all the pectins and phytonutrients like how does how does kind of seed fit into that and do you feel like because we get this from patients are like you know, I don't want to take supplements. I don't need a probiotic. Maybe I, I'm just going to eat uh, kimchi. I'm just going to eat. I'm going to drink more more kombucha. How, how do you feel about that? Like, what's your opinion on that? Um, I mean, I think that diet still is probably the number one way to rapidly, reproducibly uh, improve your health. You know, mm -hmm. I think that in addition to diet and exercise uh, and other lifestyle factors, then you can start looking at level two, which is microbes, uh, you know, things that you can't really get from diet. Um, in fermented foods, you're not really getting organisms that are of human or you're not getting human or like, you know, organisms that have the ability to colonize long term or um, that are native to the human human gastrointestinal tract. And so I think it's very different, mm -hmm. right? Like people people forget that like processed meats are technically uh, microbially per, per, like salami is technically a uh, fermented and preserved food because the lactic acid is used to preserve meat. So it doesn't spoil and doesn't get a pathogen infection. Uh, but that's very different than sauerkraut, which is a fermented cabbage, which is very different than other, other fermented foods. So I think it's, it's the, the aspect of pre-digestion of some of these uh, tougher compounds for the body to digest is important. Paradoxically, that means it's less useful for your own microbes because it's already you know, other microbes already got a first bite out of the apple, so to speak. But anyways, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I just don't know that there's that very recently did the first data come out that ever really showed that a, a high ferment diet that's high and heavy in fermented mm -hmm. foods has uh, protective benefits to the immune system. But there are some a lot of questions about the methodology on that and ex exactly mm -hmm. how, how um, it came from a prominent group. So it got a lot of pickup, but it's not it wasn't really, uh, you know, aspects of the immune system that are really well, you know, validated or, or anything like that. So um, my recommendation when it comes to it, it is to focus on your diet, actually, probably more than you focus on anything else when it comes to improving your health. Having said that, there's, it, it's not that simple, right? Like, I'll give you one example. For the longest time, the adage was like, okay, if you're constipated, just eat, uh, eat more fiber, you, need, you know, bulk, bulk, bulk more in the case of constipation. There's a very interesting study that came out of Singapore that showed that actually that uh, increase in for, for most people with chronic constipation, uh, an increase in fiber content actually made it worse. Why, well, why would, why would that be? Because if you have an evacuation disorder, now you just have more bulk material that you can't pass instead of less, right? And so that's why these, um, I, I think that explains the success of things like the carnivore diet or most elimination diets or uh, they're slowly removing things that just actually allow for more direct assimilation, but by doing so, you're kind of starving your, your, your microbiome. I mean, we know that, right? Like you're, you're that's not conjecture. That's if you don't take a uh, complex carbohydrate consumption, that's what most of the microbes in your, in your colon metabolize and feed off of. So right. start with diet, but, but I think there is a role for dietary advice in a way that's a little bit more, um, uh, dependent on the individual, but that just because I, just because something makes you feel better, you can't conflate that with it being like biologically better for you, right? Because you could have, it could not be getting to the root cause of something that's much bigger. 
um, which probiotics are are one tool to to try to address. Yeah, love that. Yeah, that's that's a great answer. I mean, you see it again with multifactorial, so complex. You have this bio individuality. You have your medical history. You have what goals and what objectives are you trying to, so, so, so many factors for sure. And I can share like my anecdotal experience of seed. I know I take it when I travel for the most part, I try to remember to take it daily. I mean, I, I do, but I find a really great benefit when I travel and this is completely anecdotal. I mean, but I, I have extra stress on my body and I don't, I, again, there's no studies on this and there's no study on me, but, and this is part of that, that what you just said, like, I feel better with this, but, what does that mean? You know, what, what what does that scientifically mean? But like, I definitely take it when I travel, I take a little travel vial and I have it and I, I, I take it because I just feel better. I feel better. And that's just me. So it's really interesting. Everyone's so unique. I always say like, we're all fingers, but when you look closely, you have this unique fingerprint, right? So mm -hmm. from far away, we're going, yeah, here's a population. This is what we need to do. Here's a generalized approach. But then you find, oh, it doesn't work for this percentage and that percentage. And maybe there's an adverse reaction here and there and it gets quite complex. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, I really appreciate what you said earlier, you know, long-term benefits and conferring long-term benefits with use of probiotics, because, you know, some studies have shown that after three weeks, they're perhaps not as efficacious as they were initially. And so I think that that's very interesting as well, of, along with lifestyle modification, whether it is a temporary elimination with, planned reintroduction that someone might be doing, um, whether it is along with other lifestyle modifications, you know, behavioral health support or um, movement routine, how these things can fit together to really all in all produce long-term efficacy for someone. Because like you mentioned, you know, a lot of these elimination diets, for example, or even supplements that someone might take, they might show short-term benefit. You might feel better in a few months and then like you said you know once the microbiome is starved you will then start to metabolize your mucosal layer you will then stop feeling the benefits and maybe even then enter into that realm of adverse effects from these different interventions that you might be trying and so it really is interesting and i really love and appreciate like you said you like we said you're so research focused and so you guys aren't out here really gimmickly trying to sell things you're not yeah. here trying to connect with just influencers you really want the science to be appreciated you want the data to be appropriately interpreted and disseminated and we think that that is so great for you know our human microbiome and then the world's microbiome i think at large yeah. well i appreciate i appreciate that sentiment um you know if you i think if people learn how to if most people just learned how to read a science like I think that being able to scan and quickly digest a, a scientific publication is a skill that everybody should, you know, if they're able to, they should try to acquire it because you learn so much, you know, the methodology is looking at how different figures are. You learn a little bit about statistics and then you learn what not to look for. Like, yeah. you know, you can just because something has statistical significance doesn't actually really mean any, I mean, you can, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, you can re really, really like data is, is what you make of it. And if you don't understand the methodology for it, then it's like reading tea leaves. And so, um, of course, that's why like having good, good protocols, having tightly defined mm -hmm. endpoints, like knowing what you're looking for and also taking the stigma out of like not meeting a, a prior, meet, not achieving an endpoint in a certain population. Mm -hmm. Like you could just say that you could just say like, okay, well, in a healthy population, this is fine, but in a constipated population, we didn't see as 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 strong of an impact. Like, mm -hmm. great, good, good, good for people to know. You know, like I just wish right. uh, there was like there's a, there's a there's a probiotics company which sells a product that they market for uh, anxiety and the gut brain mm -hmm. axis. It's like available at like a lot of whole food like supermarkets, and it's like mm -hmm. gut brain mm -hmm. axis. And like we have a publication. Okay, so go to the publication. The they looked at seven things a reduction in anxiety was like the first endpoint and actually didn't beat placebo at all. But then they pull out like to the fourth and the fifth thing, like they saw like a mild to moderate reduction in uh, insomnia and in people or like in students that were like doing this, this and this and couldn't like mm -hmm. sl sleep after an exam. And now all of a sudden they're like marketing this is it's like the greatest thing for mental health since, mm -hmm. you know, meditation, but like th mm -hmm. that's not what the paper says. And you just can't, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to some of the, I'm sure you've been to these uh, natural products expos and things mm -hmm. like that. 
but yeah. R and I were like five or six years ago, we're walking around one of them and somebody was t trying to tell us how his, uh, how their probiotic cures C. diff. Didn't even know it's a Clostridium difficile infection is. And I'm just like, dude, you can't say that. Like, <laughs> your data doesn't say that a and b you just can't say that like you you, can, you can't deceive people that have a life-threatening bacterial infection yeah. that's resistant to antibiotics that they should like try to t that they should buy your product they just don't do that i think i think i remember that guy he was in between the probiotic chips and the probiotic soda <laughs> and he was very <right> <laughs> exactly yeah we or yeah, someone we, someone was yeah for sure someone was yeah that's why we go there. We're, we're sometimes like horrified a bit. I mean, just seeing some of the products, I mean, let alone, I mean, the supplement kind of bias and the whole marketing gimmicks of supplements and then even the foods. And it's like, what, what's going on here? It's, it's a world of, of just deceiving people. And, it, and it, I, got, I don't know, that goes down a rabbit hole of like greed and everything. But um, yeah, but but yeah I, leave but, those, I leave those I leave those events not wanting to eat. Yeah. Not, not wanting to ever go to Whole Foods again right like it just it's just not that's it's just not like that's that's not the right way to approach health like you shouldn't make mm -hmm. a new health is just it's it's a lot simpler it's not getting like a better version of a potato chip you know like mm -hmm. that's and and masquerade and dressing that up as like healthier dr dressing up healthier snacking as health or conflating right. it with health robs people of the information they need to truly lead, lead healthy lifestyles and make better decisions for their, for their, uh, anyways, it's, it's a, it's a point that I feel very strongly about because I think mm -hmm. the whole industry is just, uh, starting with food has just become, um, you know, not a very, uh, it, it's departed from what it set out, what it started to do. Mm -hmm. it, it speaks to that, like greenwashing, right? I think that's like the general term. I mean, it's even, I don't know if there's a thing like health food washing or organic washing, but it's more like the greenwashing, right? It's like, oh, these people want to be healthy. We're going to manipulate them and make it and squeeze as much money out of them as possible. And it kind of just, yeah, it speaks to that. And we feel you, we feel that. I mean, when we go to Natural Products Expo, which we're planning to go to, there's some good, out of everything we find there, there's maybe like, it's becoming less and less, like 1% or less of actually good things. Um, but but something you said just kind of sparked interest of, like when you do go to these grocery stores or at expos or different supplement conventions or anything, are you like horrified for the majority of that time? And then are you seeing like, a big question is your supplement isn't refrigerated and there's a bunch of refrigerated like probiotics, right? Like, how do you feel about what you're seeing out there? And are you kind of looking and is that fun for you or is it horrifying Re for you? I mean, this is a good myth busting moment. Refrigerated probiotics are inferior products. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, 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 if you have to refrigerate, the, the process by which a strain is cultivated, grown, lyophilized is all the same. Refrigeration mm -hmm. extends shelf life of products and it means that the manufacturer is not, A, A doesn't have stable strains or B is not including sufficient overages to create a, sta a shelf stable product, right? Microbes mm -hmm. in lyophilized state can comfortably survive temperatures. We've shown this in our product up to 120 degrees for 48 hours. Like if you have a good, if you have a good cryoprotected selection, if you, have, if you have good manufacturing processes, you don't have fragile organisms that then you pay more money for so they can make a cheaper product. It makes no sense to me, and it gives the, it gives this allure of uh, freshness, right? Like this, like it's it's refrigerated, so you're keeping it alive, or you're keeping it fresh. Absolutely not. It's, there's no the, the lyophilization process is the exact same. They they're just probably mm -hmm. trying to improve increase the shelf life of their product so that it, they can have three years of shelf life instead of eighteen months. You know, by making you refrigerate it. That's that's all. That's all it really is. And it's interesting, not just really the storage of the products, but really the packaging of the products. One thing we really love because we just have such an appreciation for environmental nutrition and the soil microbiome, we really appreciated the packaging. And not only is it more eco-friendly because it does come in a glass packaging, but can you speak a little bit to the reasons why you guys decided to put it in that you know darker glass bottle? And if that is in order to protect the strains or if it's, you know, for the reason of reducing plastic usage, or we kind of would love to speak to that as well, because we have really conscious consumers who follow us. Yeah, it's, it's more for sustainability. The, the whole supply chain we've built, we invested a lot in sustainability. 
Um, mm -hmm. UV, again, like to my point about heat, UV radiate, like su sunlight and amb ambient sunlight or indirect sunlight is not, not really, you know, doesn't make that big of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that, that if you, the amount of th shit that we consume and throw away is just mind boggling. And so yeah. the idea that you can just get a refill each month, refill it in, keep it, and then, you know, just have one, one simple thing. I think it's part of a, like, Okay. A, lar a larger approach to just having less of a footprint, less of an environmental impact. And you know, as a company, it, it, it sounds small. You're one company with one product, but as you scale and, you know, we open source all of our uh, materials for other companies to go and find. It took us a lot of time and money to invest in developing these, but just, we just give that away to say like, like if you guys can do better then then do better. Um, and so oh, our, our, our packaging is, our packaging, we had to, we had to achieve something which is very hard, which is to make something which is water, has low water activity, but it's also compostable. And that's yeah. virtually, that's virtually, you know, it's hard to block, to have that protective effect. Truthfully, plastic is an amazing material in that regard. We just use too much of it, uh, all of the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And this is a conversation with a six year old, a six and a half year old daughter. I was just having this conversation with her the other day. I don't recall where we were, um, but we were out at a store with uh, family members and I was overwhelmed by the amount of st stuff, right? To me, it was just like junk, um, litter, really, that was lined wall to wall in this grocery store. And I was like, can you believe that this is one store in one city, one location? And look at all of these things that are gonna ultimately end up in a landfill. And we're not the only ones who are in this store. There are so many other locations. And so we just have such an appreciation for others who are really consciously yeah. saying like, like you said, you're one company, but this one company is really doing its part to make that difference. And we just, we thought it was so cool. We appreciate that you guys sent us some, but I just want people to see, because <laughs> we just think it's so cool. There are different sizes of these, um, the packaging it is glass packaging which we love and then the refills like you said they come in this um compostable or more paper packaging so i had such an appreciation for that for those not only concerned with what's going in their bodies but what's going around their bodies because ultimately when that junk that's lined wall to wall in these stores ends up decomposing over the hundreds or thousands of years that it takes ultimately it makes its way into our environment, right? When it rains, um, when the sun breaks down some of these different chemicals and you know the plastic, these things ultimately end up making their way into the soil that end up making their way into our plants that we're consuming or if, you know, for those who consume animal products, like that makes its way into the animals that makes its way ultimately into your body. And so yeah. for those of us who have that appreciation for the soil microbiome, I just, again, thought that this was such a cool aspect. Well, in a, an interesting study in the Journal of Nature, and, and I want to get your opinion, obviously, Raja, is, is you know, showing that a, a large majority of, of the seeding that happens or where our microbes are coming from is from our environment, right? So, I mean, uh, seeing this gut environment connection, gut brain connection, I mean, do you feel like the gut is just the nexus or like it's just connected to everything or how are you feeling? Or do you feel like that gets overused? What's, what's your opinion on kind of the gut being connected to everything? I mean, it is connected to everything, um, but people- Good answer, I'm, I'm testing you, man. No, I'm just kidding. People, yeah, no, people, people really overrepresent what we know today, though. My, you know, my point is like, you have to go back and give, do science the right way, and that requires clean data mm -hmm. in a large population that takes time, right? And reproducibility. And so I, 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 I don't want to discount that it is related. I mean, it, you see, mechanism papers which are amazing they show you if you cut off uh, communications between the gut and the brain then very specific things happen and conversely if you cut off communication sometimes you can stop things like parkinson's or alzheimer's from developing because these are inflammatory uh you know in, in some way inflammatory uh, mediators and so that's we just now the the dark side of it that nobody's talking about like take think about like a stool transplant for example like, what if you solve your Clostridium diffuse, your C. diff infection, but you're, tra you're, in you're transplanting Alzheimer's for somebody 30 years from now without even knowing it? Like, you just don't know, you know, we don't have enough information. Mm -hmm. And so it is connected, but I think that, um, I think people need to just cool off for a little bit and let the work get done. Uh, and mm -hmm. then we can actually talk about it. Like, I, you know, we've, 
we have research programs in all these different areas and got brain access with Caltech and with a very, very large data uh, uh, cohort and study. It's about 10,000 people that we're starting to get back the data and think about if we can do things for metabolism or, uh, you know, type two diabetes, obesity, body mass, uh, de depression, right? Like w one, one really interesting statistic that proves to you that it is connected is that if you, a study that came out or a paper that came out in science earlier this year, that for people that have depression, major depressive disorder, if you just try to look at their gut microbiome, maybe 40 or 50% of the time, you can try to correlate people, but you have a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you start to now analyze their blood and their urine and there's, there's gut microbiome together, 96%, 96% you could predict from a blind sample that whether that person with accuracy has, has major depressive disorder or not. So that shows you that these, these things are related, right? Like it does, mm -hmm. it is involved. What that doesn't do is it doesn't tell you what your treatment should be or how you can act on it. And that's mm -hmm. where people are over-representing, I think, today. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. And that's where, yeah, you get a lot of these different testing or these different treatments that, uh, I mean, I don't know how you feel. And I know this is maybe getting off a little bit, but, you know, some of the testing out there, where it's like, hey, we're going to test your stool and tell you what to eat. And this is going to help you with A, B, C, and, and it. We're we're obviously not feeling it. I mean, I don't know if you want to give your opinion on that, but I, I think you kind of already did. But go into it a little bit more. But we we have we just get that kind of that weird feeling inside of like this. We're not there yet. Like slow down. Like you said. Like hold your horses a little bit. We're we're nowhere near there. There's still so much to be done. And yes, it's exciting. And yes, it's great. And yes, there's probably a lot of money to be made, which is fine. We're not against making money when you're actually helping people. But we kind of feel like people are getting a little ahead of themselves just to get ahead and to say, we're the first one doing this. And we got this. Look at us. And it, it gets a little bit like, wow, because overwhelming. Because we see the patients who come bring their results to us. And they say, oh, well, you know, I had this one sample done and all of these are my inflammatory foods and these are my superfoods. And then I redid my sample a few months later and now they've flip flopped. And yeah. so, you know, again, you want to ask, okay, what technology is this stool testing company using? Um, you know, what other variables factored into them having these results? And, you know, like James said, like, is the technology even there yet? So we'd love to get your opinion if you have one on some of these microbiome stool tests. Yeah. You know, it's, it's basically, trying to build a, a company is trying to build their data set on mm -hmm. uh, crowd of people on paying customers instead of on um, non paying customers like how science should do it. So mm -hmm. I'm not very supportive. I think that there's a lot of over representation of what we know today mm -hmm. based on stool, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and, and actually, as I told, as I shared with you, the, the way that the field's moving is actually away from stool stools like one, mm -hmm counter it's good for infection right like a stool like if you want to know if you have an infection like a stool test can be efficacious it could tell you that that but but that's it that's that's what it tells you right um right. your microbiome varies throughout your life throughout what what would make sense is is if you sequenced your microbiome from let's say the age of like two or three like once you start to get to a steady state microbiome right early in life and then if you were, if you had the financial means and you were curious enough over time or over periods of duress to see which organisms you're losing, uh, you know, and, and, and j just for information, then you, then you can start to see, you know, these are organisms that played in your life a very close uh, relationship, right, in, in, in your the evolution and um, programming of your immune system. So that's, that would be interesting for me. Uh, but you can't just blindly say, okay, take this and we'll tell you, for example, like what to eat. If you don't know, you, you, you can't do that. In fact, I would even say um, some of them are like, are, are, are wrong. It's, it's, it's bad advice, right? Like there's one stool test that tells people, oh, you don't have the organisms that can convert uh, brassica into, sulf you know, isothiocinates mm -hmm. into sulforaphan, for example. So don't eat broccoli. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. Don't, don't tell people not to eat broccoli. I don't care what your mm -hmm. test says. It's like so hubristic to, 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 tell anybody that they should not eat the most validated genus or family of health of, from a health standpoint of food all the time because of their in-house test and their algorithm says that you'd be suboptimal for you. So that's a perfect example of where you're overreaching. You know, you can't say that. And then, and then it's always, there's, there's very shifty. There's like a series of questions you can ask, like, 
like what data set what data set informed that recommendation and you just get the runaround when you try to understand how they're thinking about things and so i do think it is a commercial i do think it is a you know contrary to that we sell a physical product that you can take and try and if you feel benefits and you can read the science you take it or you don't take it we're not telling you all these things about that we know about you that that you have to pay give us money for so that we can tell you right like that's that's where i i, I draw a pretty hard line and that's and so that is amazing what you said it, it's not yeah, it's not gimmicky, right? It's so gimmicky, or it is It is kind of like convoluted, like, yeah, give us this, and we'll give you that. Like, a, it's a very shady deal. So there's that, and then there's your consciousness with the packaging. I wanted to show, this is the this is the plastic replacement. This is an algae paper. So instead of plastic, it's it's the, the attention to detail in the research and actually just looking at that research and looking at that function and not necessarily just the quantity of the microbes or the quantity of a certain genus or, or species. Um, so it's, it's all these things. And then on top of that, like you mentioned, your crowdfunding, like, hey, we did all this work. And if someone wants to do it better, here's all our information, like, go ahead and do it better. I think these are all signs of a truly conscious company. It's not greenwashed. It's not gimmicky. It's not here to sell you something that, that you know, isn't going to do what it says it's going to do or, or, or like over promising, under delivering. Like these are all like the check marks we saw to go like, this is awesome. Right. So it's like, that's why we, we love having you here and we love kind of sharing this knowledge and information and kind of cutting through these myths because so many people are confused. And not only that, like you mentioned, they do some of these tests and they're worse off than when they started. And that, kills us as health professionals, as practitioners who have a private practice, we're like, oh my gosh, not only did you spend $1,000, but you spent $1,000 on all these different tests to end up worse off than when you started and, it's, and more confused, right? So, I mean, so one of, I mean, we can go on forever, but one of the last questions, I mean, where do you see the future of like human understanding of the microbiome or the microbiota and all these species and how we interact and connect? Like what's, what's your vision for that future and, and helping people get better educated? I mean, I really do think that in the next 10 years, if it's not us, it's gonna be somebody else if we'd like for it to be us, that we can be in a position where there's conditions or use cases that we know, you know, this combination, it's never gonna be one microbe, but this ecology will, be good for depression or this ecology will be good for you know if you, if you can't lose weight beyond a certain point when you eat the exact same diet as somebody else but you change your microbiome all of a sudden now you can right that's mm -hmm. and it just it's just a very uh or or if you you know that you have a epoe you know a genetic risk for alzheimer's that you can correlate you can we know which organisms ultimately and which which microbial dna is a big dry, driver of amyloid plaque formation so you can try to mitigate that. You can knock those organisms out or you can replace them with something better. Like, I think it'll be, um, it's never going to be as black and white as like, take this test and then this is what you do, right? Like, it's always going to be information that as uh, science and, and it's not going to be medical doctors, unfortunately, I, in, in our current medical system, but there will be people that will be appropriately trained to understand that data in ways that have big data to support interventions that can improve health so that's really what what from a probiotic standpoint i think that's really what what we're all excited by right is really getting to that to that future where you really know what you're doing um i think we're also excited about going outside of the gut microbiome i mean you know mm -hmm. how, how you take how you brush your teeth and take care of your mouth and or how you mm -hmm. take care of your, your infants and babies when they're first born like there's the you can't give the same infant formula to a baby in the first two weeks as you should in two months later, because the profile in breast milk is much different. Breast milk is very different in, 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 the, in certain periods of time, right? Like, we're, that's what we're starting to figure out and really learn and become more precise um, about how we think about all of these aspects of life. I think it'll make a, I think that microbes will dramatically change um, how we take, how people take care of their skin, for example, mm -hmm. or you have a skin microbiome that's driving this chronic lifelong inflammatory signals or anti-inflammatory signals we have to, we our collaborators of our top universities on this have spent a decade trying to understand which microbes are anti-inflammatory which versus which ones are inflammatory and this is top top research from mit and ucla that's the basis of our skin program right so 
-hmm. like th this is the kind of stuff that I think is really exciting is really exciting because you don't really hear um or you hear it referenced vaguely like oh well you're, you're keep your to keep your skin in balance okay well is that <laughs> come on guys what does that mean like what do you it's, it's just a marketing it's just marketing you know like it's not a, yeah. there's not there's no there's no data really behind it so I think that's going to be cool um over the next and we're probably like three to 10 years away from that from that future cool. which is really cool very cool and i feel i feel like yeah that's that's a innovative and something to look forward to way of saying let's work with our microbes right i think i think for so long one i think there's still a lot of people that don't realize i mean they realize they're there but not to what extent and then two, I think we've we've had this campaign of like, ill microbes, germs, ill, and, and it's bad, bad, bad. And and don't get me wrong, there are some some crazy characters out there. But overall, it, it's exciting to see. Work with your microbes for your skin. Work with your microbes for cardiovascular health. And it, it is so beyond gut health. But really, uh, us, of course, we feel like the gut is is this core. It's one of the big roots for sure. But this is working with your microbes. I love that. That's very sure. exciting. We, we are looking forward to reading everything and anything that comes out from seed and like looking at it and seeing what happens with the peer review with a lot of these studies and just, it's so exciting. It, it's really refreshing to talk to you. Where can people find you, find seed and get, so seed is a, a membership. Yeah. Like, so getting seed and the daily symbiotic. So where can people find all that? The information that you're putting out. Yeah, you can only get seed in one place, and we do that by design. We want to be able to communicate and educate uh, with people without any dilution in between it. It's just seed.com on Instagram. Check us, check it out at seed. We post really nice things and really informative as well. Um, and uh, read our emails, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. I would just say I would I would I would encourage people to stay in touch like that. Wonderful. Raja, man, it was great. This was so fun. Again, we could go for like another hour, uh, but yeah, this is awesome. An hour That's went by like that. Brain. I hope everyone enjoyed it. We'll be, this will be uh, reposted and we'll chop it up and be sharing it all around. And uh, so, yeah, so comment below, whether you're live or even after this, let us know for next time what questions you have and where you want to kind of learn a little bit more. Go check out seed.com. And it's one of the best and not the best, I think, symbiotics probiotics out there for sure so thank you roger we appreciate your time man and we yeah like you. likewise no thank you guys for your questions are really I, I feel like they're all coming from the right place so thank you for uh amplifying the the science scientific literacy message yeah thank you so much yeah. have a great friday great rest of your weekend and we'll talk to you soon man all right, all right. thanks guys thank you bye, bye.